Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we're broadcasting from tonight. We pay our respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. Welcome to UQ Talks, where we ignite your curiosity with fascinating presentations from the brightest minds at your university. I'm Tegan Taylor, I'm a journalist with ABC Radio National, and I'm your host and moderator for this series. Tonight, we've got some very exciting panelists here to help us wrap our heads around the science and philosophy of decision-making. We'll be discussing the big ideas about what makes a good decision, practical goals, unconscious bias, regret avoidance, and the fundamentals of why our brains make the decisions that we do. We hope to send you away with some insights around making better choices. Before I introduce our speakers, a reminder that this is your talk, and you can be part of the discussion by asking questions using the Q&A button on your screen as we go tonight. Thank you to some of you who've submitted some terrific questions in advance. I can't wait to put them to the panel, who I will introduce right now, starting with Professor Deborah Brown, whose research interests span from early modern philosophy to the philosophy of mind and metaphysics. Professor Jason Mattingly, who researches the roles played by attention, prediction and decision making in regulating perceptual, cognitive and motor functions in the human brain. And Professor Lionel Page, who conducts research linking insights from economic theory and from other behavioural sciences such as psychology. His research into individual decision making considers gender biases, halo effects and hesitations. A lot of technical language and I'm so excited to dig in. The, the title of this talk is about the science and philosophy of decision making, which feels kind of self-evident, but I think we should actually start with the question, what is a decision? Jason, what's our brain doing when we're making a decision? Well, I, I'm probably biased, but I would say <laughs> that, a, a, that what the brain does, everything the brain does, is really a decision. If you start at the point of how we gather information through our senses, and then we have to act in some way, we have to behave in some way, um, everything in between, in a way, is a decision. So it could be something as simple as looking at a person coming down the corridor toward you and trying to work out, do I know that person? Is that someone who's familiar to me? What's that person's name? That's a kind of decision, a very simple one. All the way through to, you know, who do I choose as a life partner or should I take out a loan on this home, right? So all of that is decision making, at least from a psychology and from a neuroscience perspective. But Lionel, we heard him use the word bias there, which is like one of your like trigger words. <laughs> Talk to me about the role of bias in decision making. Well, the, um, you know, decisions is when you have to, to choose something and you don't choose all the things. So it's economics also looks a lot at, at, at decisions. So bias is... Uh, Often we make decisions and often you can regret it. You know, you, you decide to eat too much ice cream and you regret it afterwards, or maybe you drink too much alcohol one night and you regret it after, after that. So often the decisions we make, you know, they are not always aligned with the kind of goals or plans, the long-term goals or long-term plans we have. So a uh, very interesting aspect of looking at decisions, how can we help people uh, make better decisions that they are you know, compatible with the kind of thing they want to do. And, and there are plenty of aspects, in partly with modern life, because Jason was talking about the brain, which has evolved from an ancient past, you know, and modern life is very different, um, longer time span and, and, and you know, complex aspects like financial decisions we are not used to. And so how can we help people in this complex world make better decisions and, and not fall prey to biases? So, Deb, from a philosopher's point of view, what types of decisions, not just which put path, part of the footpath to put your foot on, which types of decisions are worth interrogating? Well, from a philosophical perspective, um, decision-making refers to the last step in a chain of reasoning before action. So, I mean, that would be the paradigm example of decision-making, you know, where, you know, you use your reasoning capabilities, the best of your ability, you try and counteract those cognitive biases, you know, to, to end up with a resolution or a judgment about what you ought to do. So philosophically, decision making is a very normative exercise. What do you mean it's, by that? Well, it's so it's it's normed by the true and the good. Insofar as it's a response to your reasoning, your reasons are things that you hope track the truth. And you have a concern for the truth which is you know, what makes you essentially a human rational agent. And you make decisions um, with respect to actions 
because you're representing the outcomes of those actions under the aspect of the good, you know, they're as being good for you. That's the kind of paradigm example, which would make decision making very rational, very conscious. But and, and that actually comes from the root um, of decision. The root of it is the Latin term desiderare, which means to to cut off or to stop that reasoning uh, process. But there's that doesn't mean we have to kind of stick with the ent- etymology of it, right? I mean, there's been a lot of semantic drift and and that's why Jason is talking about how, you know, people nowadays refer to kind of simpler control mechanisms in the brain, some of which may not even be conscious mm. and certainly are not rational. But I think there's an open question whether um, that's appropriate, whether we ought to allow our term for decision making to lose its connection with these normative questions about what what is a good decision to make. Mm. Um, I think for a philosopher, saying you can make a decision without asking the question whether it was good or bad is not something that's obviously um, coherent, but it certainly is an open question. Mm. And we, for example, think of corporations as making decisions and and Do they really? the, and <laughs> or is it, the, is it an individual within the corporation? Well, well that's someone a, yeah. does, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's no, it's a really great question. It has to do with, with what a, a corporation is. I mean, corporations are regarded as persons under the law, mm-hmm. uh, for example. If the corporation is just like a sequence of time slices of all the individuals who are making executive decisions in it, then the corporation's decisions will reduce to that of, of the individuals making the decisions. Mm. But corporations actually have responsibility for their decisions, in a sense, you know, going forward and independently of those who make decisions, which is why they often have to make reparations for past actions. Mm. So, so, so yeah. a neuroscientist, I would think you have to have an information processing system. And to us, that's the brain. It could be an animal brain or a human brain. But ultimately, the decision making process has to be embodied in, in that processor. So a kind of distributed decision, something that's at the level of a whole corporation, I would say, I, I can't see how that can happen. You could be an individual, could be influenced Isn't by it? other people, Isn't but the corporation that? can't make the decision. But can you take the corporation as a metaphor for the brain? Because in the brain, you have also cognitive processes, which you know are different and decentralized, and they're aggregated and you make a final decision. You could think of the CEO as a person getting lots of advice from different parts of the organization, eventually aggregating that in, in, in a final I, decision. I could see that as the, in the information gathering component. I could see that a corporation might be like a, a brain with each individual like a neuron in the brain, for right. example. But at some point where we're constrained as, as animals, as people, we have to act. We have to make an action. And I would say the corporation doesn't act in, 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 on block, it's individuals within the corporation that have to act. And I, mm-hmm. I don't want to disparage corporations, but I think the human brain is a bit better at working in harmony with itself than corporations <laughs> often are. You talked about corporations before. Do you think that it's possible for them to, a corporation can make a decision that can't be leveled at, at an individual? I, I think, <coughs> uh, you know, I, I use a corporation often as a metaphor for the brain because we think of the brain, we think that there's this little voice in our head, mm. which is us. Mm. And I'm sure you agree, it's very misleading because there's a lot of things happening in our brain that we're not aware of. There's right. a lot of processes gathering things. information, giving us feelings, gut feelings, information. And this is aggregated and then eventually, you know, our voice makes sense of all that and then we, we rationalize and we have stories about where we make decisions. And in, it's messy, like mm. in a corporation you know, mm. in a way, right? Mm. And, and Often the CEO makes decisions, but if all the advisors say, you know, that's a good decision, that's a good decision, the CEO doesn't make a decision, just say, just validates. In the same way as mm-hmm. often we are going to validate our feelings. You visit a new flat to um, rent the flat or not, very quickly you get feelings. And, you know, you, you can rationalize after why you make the decision, but the decision was already made from your feelings. I think that that's, that's, that's where I see the connection of the metaphor. I understand. Yeah. Let's come back to collective decision making in a bit, because I do want to dig into that. But you're talking about gut feelings. Where do they come? Like, can you trust your gut? And where do these gut feelings actually, what informs them? I, I think, and sure, Jason will have more to say about it, but I think often we have a negative um, discourse about gut feeling and intuitions, etc. But, but one of these gut feelings and intuitions is that, you know, our brain is well designed for us to make decisions, at least some st- type of decisions, not maybe financial decisions. But um, gut feelings and intuitions are the kind of all brain processes, processing a lot of information in the background and give, feeding that to us at, in terms of values. Like, and as I said, you visit a flat, 
and you'll feel, hmm, you don't like it. What does it mean? Well, maybe your brain picked out uh, the fact that it was far from the train station, the fact that the paint is, 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 is not very good, the fact that maybe it didn't feel safe when you're walking in the streets. All these things that you don't need to voice mm. over have been aggregated in a feeling. This feeling is information, so we should not dismiss it. And sometimes these feelings are going to be mismatched with the real world we're living in. But often they're not. Often they're very good guys to decision. What else mm. informs like these well, are they unconscious biases, right? Exactly. I was going to say, I think the, the, the question and, and Lionel's response there is really about unconscious factors that, that bias or influence our decisions. And we can't always articulate the reasons for our decisions. Um, it's, it's often very difficult to know why we, we have a particular preference, for example. Um, I often give the example of, you know, two chocolate bars. Which one do you prefer, the, the Snickers or the Kit Kat? You know, um, a decision like that, there's no right answer. Incorrect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to so, say Snickers. Oh, really? So, yeah. Fight you. Sorry. Yeah. But, but that's the point. So <laughs> here we have a, a panel with different preferences for something as simple as a chocolate mm -hmm. bar. And often those preferences we don't articulate, we don't make them explicit. Um, we, we, we don't attach them to any formal sort of rational thinking. Yeah. Um, and so I think that this point about what, what are the influences of these unconscious uh, effects, unconscious, we call them biases, they could be good biases, but they could be bad biases, things that throw us off the scent. Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about intuitions and gut feelings, you know, there's a sort of ambiguity at play there. I mean, sometimes if you make a decision very quickly, you may think you've just gone with your gut, but it might be based you know, and sort of habitual knowledge and information that, you know, you're not exactly aware of. I mean, when you first start learning to drive a car, you're making decisions all the time and it's all very conscious and it's all. And then those, you know, those kinds of patterns become habitual and automated. You're still making decisions when you drive a car, even when you're on automatic pilot. Um, but, you know, but it's just, it is just more automatic, but there is that kind of wealth of, of um, you know, kind of knowledge and information behind it. And then there are just cases where you're, you know, you do just make a decision too quickly. You are, and you, th you know, you, th you think you can trust your gut, right. um, and that's often the root of a lot of bad decisions. Right. Yeah, ra yeah. rapid un yeah. under pressure. We we often talk about mm -hmm. making decisions under risk, risk and uncertainty. Those two words you'll hear again and again in philosophy, in economics, in psychology, those two things where you don't know what the best outcome is, you don't necessarily know how to weight the information you have in front of you, and you're trying to work out what's the risk profile here. Um, doesn't really matter whether I choose the wrong chocolate bar, but it really might matter if I make the wrong decision about whether to go or stop in my car. Mm -hmm. If these biases are unconscious, how do we become conscious of them so that we can then rationalise with them? Mm. Well, it's, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually, I mean, there's been a lot of work done in, uh, in psychology, particularly around the work of Kahneman and Tversky mm. on cognitive biases. And, and you can actually demonstrate them to, you know, to people um, quite simply. Uh, I mean, we teach critical thinking in philosophy. And, and one of the first things we do is sort of expose people to their cognitive biases. I mean, we all are subject to cognitive biases. It's not as if you can ever really escape them. So you have to sort of develop strategies for, for managing them. You know, but, but you can, you know, you can take people through a reasoning process and see how it feels so natural, so intuitive. And then, oops, you've just committed a base rate fallacy or you've got the confirmation bias or that's the anchoring effect. And people go, oh my gosh, you know. So making so much, unconscious yeah. things explicit. Yes. Is part of so, the critical thinking I, idea. Here, here I add maybe a, a, a slight contradiction. Uh, is that we, I worked a lot on biases, but um, a lot of the biases which have been found in psychological studies, you know, is, are like uh, visual illusions. So um, our eye system, our visual system works very well. But, you know, if I throw a ball at you, you're going to be able to catch it. It's a very complex problem to catch a, a flying ball, and we do it very easily. Uh, but if I give you a very uh, a specific drawing, I put you in some kind of situation, you, you may have visual illusions. And visual illusions can be seen as edge cases, which are kind of all visual system, which makes very good inferences very quickly. Mm. In some specific places, which are unusual, will be tricked and will make mistakes. And a lot of the biases found in, in the psychology literature are also in this kind of, you know, we design the experiment in a specific case where edge you can cases. find edge cases where mm -hmm. like, people make mistakes. But these biases exist, but uh, there's a risk also to focus too much on them, mm. to, uh, which leads to the view that us as humans were very poor at making decisions. While in the same way as our visual system works in the real world, in the real world, you know, we make decisions between mm. chocolate bars or coffee and chocolates very quickly. Yeah. 
and yeah. pretty well. I mean, it doesn't mean that we make mistakes in unusual situations, as I said, like if you have to choose a pension scheme, mm. our ancestors were not selected to make this kind of decision. So we may have systematic errors there. But for most of the decisions, it's amazing how much information we process and how quick we make good decisions. Mm. Yeah, no, it is true. Most of our decisions, like most of our beliefs are likely to be true. Most right. of our decisions are likely to be good. It's just in those really complex cases, you know, and often where there are, you know, high stakes, um, you know, that's, that's where once, as, when we ramp up the level of complexity of the problem, then that's when we start to really see it. I mean, you just have to look at, for example, the kind of base rate fallacies that were occurring uh, around, you know, COVID. Can right? you we're, talk about what that actually means? Oh, What's a base rate fallacy? Oh, well, that's, you know, that's where you sort of... Um, uh, making judgments based on a misrepresentation of of what the you know the how likely something is how likely something is relative to its base. So there was a lot of you know talk about oh you know more people who are vaccinated are dying than people who are unvaccinated, and that's just a classic base rate fallacy because ninety seven percent of the exactly population, the population. Was vaccinated <laughs> by that yeah, stage, yeah you know but when you actually looked at at the probabilities. You know, that was five times more. You were five times more likely to die from COVID if you were unvaccinated. Um, and so, you know, so there are these kind of crucial cases where, where the information is complex, where it's hard to, you know, to estimate the probabilities that we, we can make really significant mistakes. But people are very influenced mm. by um, the availability of information. Mm. So if you're mm. listening to the news every day in the time of COVID, you're listening to the radio and you're listening to the television and you're hearing about these unusual cases where someone has a bad reaction to a vaccine or dies as a consequence of a vaccine, that's what sticks in your mind. Mm. You have that immediately yeah. available to you when you are then confronted with the decision about whether you should get the vaccine yourself. Right. What you're not seeing are all of the cases of vaccination that went just fine. Um, and so people are very prone to jumping on information that they heard about recently or that they've had many experiences of before. Once that information is very available, it, it kind of looms large and gets a, a more of a weighting in people's decision-making process. Lena? I, I, I'll add on that that um, part of the mistakes are not, uh, you're totally wrong what you said, but part of the mistakes are not just individual mistakes. I think, you know, we saw with vaccines, when people start uh, thinking about where they want to believe, they also belong to groups, mm. and part of the decision to believe or not depends on which group you, you, you are part of and which group you want to be part of and which kind of the narrative of which group. Mm. And so you've got this kind of coalitional mm. thinking. And if my group thinks that, you know, vaccines are bad, then I'm going to be much more receptive to any kind of evidence or suggestive evidence that uh, vaccines are bad. Mm. And so part of the mistakes and is because the payoffs of the, the, the thing people care about is not just the truth. Mm. Is you know the group dynamics to which they belong. And, and, We're social and actually, animals after you're all. You're social animals. So in addition to having unconscious biases in our own brain, we also could have them in a group. Oh, so totally. they're, they're sort of amplified in a group. One of the things I'm noticing as we're speaking is that we're kind of throwing around this idea of a good decision. Oh, we make a good decision or we make a bad decision. But we haven't actually defined what is a good decision. Teb, mm. what would you say it is? Well, I, I would say that a good decision is the product of a robust exercise in reasoning, right? So, you know, where you are, you know, you are seeking, um, you know, the, you know, the information that's that's relevant and significant for what it is you're making the decision about. Um, your even though knowing about your biases is not sufficient for counteracting them at all. In fact, there's a lovely fallacy called the GI Joe fallacy. Okay. Which um, I've is, know <laughs> this is the fallacy of thinking that if you know about a cognitive bias, you can correct it. Right? <laughs> and it, it has to do with the fact that the G.I. Joe series always ended with a public service news announcement and the slogan, now you know. You know. <laughs> well, well, now you know does not actually mean that you're going to be able to avoid making a false belief. Um, you know, but but we you know we can you know train ourselves and we can collaboratively reason with others to check our biases as best as we can. We can you know do lateral searches if we're looking for information uh, out there to check whether the sources of information are you know aligning with one another, and we can think about the credibility of sources and so on to make our reasoning as robust as possible. Um, I think you know that's the best way to. To ensure, you know, I mean, it was not really ensure, but it's going to increase the likelihood that you make good decisions, or at least increase the likelihood that you won't make bad decisions. Mm. This how is my grand hope, anyway. <laughs> how does that definition square with 
your your perspective. I was thinking of something much simpler. I was thinking mm. a good decision is just a decision that yields a good outcome for you at that moment. As right? an individual. As an individual. And one could think about, you know, philosophically and as a society, is, is that a good decision? At, at the level of, the, of myself, the decision I make that yields the outcome I seek, that's a good decision. But is that a good decision for my, my, peer, my peer group? Is that a good decision for my family? Is that a good decision for society more generally? Mm. You know, in the decisions we make, uh, when, when I, I, I leave this panel discussion today, I'll go and hop in my car and drive home. Um, you know, that's a decision I'm making. It suits me now. Is that good for climate change? You know, I, so I think we, there are levels of how we can define a good decision at the level of the individual, the group, the society, and so on. Just a reminder that you can submit your questions to this very impressive array of brains um, at any time by cl clicking on the Q&A button. A couple of people submitted questions beforehand, and I thought that this one from Janelle is quite pertinent to now. Uh, Janelle says, I believe there are no right or wrong, good or bad decisions. Although it may have good or bad consequences, the decision itself should not be classified as right or wrong. Is this theory backed by any of your research? Janelle sounds like a philosopher. <laughs> yes, that does sound like a philosophical question. And it's a really great question because it's, it's not obvious that, you know, that you could um, you know, ma be making a good decision, or at least it's an open question, whether you could be making a good decision and it, you know, and it have uh, you know, bad consequences or, I mean, was it really good if it leads to bad consequences? So there's a kind of gap between how we evaluate the decision and how we evaluate the outcome. But, but philosophically, um, you know, a lot of the historical work around decision making has it's kind of argued, you know, that if you, if, you make, if you make your decision making as responsive to, to reason as possible, then even if you don't obtain what you want or, you know, optimise the outcomes for yourself, and that's going to invariably happy beca happen because we can't predict the future. There's inevitable uncertainty when we're making decisions because they're future focused and we can't mm -hmm. predict the future. What, what happens least... when we change our mind? Oh, Maybe gonna... that's an example of a bad decision, right? <laughs> right. No, well, finish, not necessarily. Finish, yeah. Not necessarily. Um, so, yeah, so, so you still have the satisfaction, even if you have a bad outcome from your decision, you still have the satisfaction of having reason to the best of your ability and judged in accordance with reason. So you can have a good decision that has, you know, a bad outcome on, on that view. Um, the issue about whether you change your mind or not is, you know, that, that we want that to be a good thing, right? That is a good thing. But how do you it's know when to change your mind? I mean, this is something yeah. we do research on in mm. my lab. Um, we look at very simple situations where people measure brain activity while they're making decisions. And we look at what's, what goes on in the brain just before somebody makes a decision that they say, oh, actually, I'd like to change my mind mm. on that. Um, and in those cases, what you often see is a very sort of noisy pattern of brain activity. So as a neuroscientist, you would say the amount of noise in the system, our, our, the brain is not deterministic, obviously, there's a lot, it's, it's probabilistic and there's a lot of noise in the system. In cases where that noise has kind of um, outstripped the signal, if you like, they're cases of maybe bad decisions, or at least decisions where people realize that's not the outcome I wanted, I need to change my mind, I need to change my behavior in some way to, to get a better outcome. I want to get down to practical um, things because I feel like we could talk in circles and there's so much to go to, to unpack here. But if someone's logged on today because they want to help in making a decision, a big decision, or they're part of a corporation that is making decisions that impact large groups of people, what kind of rubrics or frameworks or the, I don't know what the terminology is, what, what kind of processes could people use to make these not chocolate bar decisions, big mm -hmm. decisions? Lionel, you've looked at this. I've looked at this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's complex. I think um, besides psychology, I think one problem of organizations, you know, they're messy. We were talking about how they are messy before, is that often incentives in organizations are not well designed. Like people have, organizations are different people. Different people want different things. Uh, so maybe, you know, the stakeholders, uh, shareholders want profit and the CEO also you know, wants uh, a, a nice uh, jet trip to nice, you know, destinations, etc. And the employees want a raise. And so all that makes mean that you have conflicts, etc. And so part of the good decision, part of the problem that you have in organizations is that incentives are, are are not congruent to for an organization to work. And what's in our brain is that, you know, our cells work together because they have the kind of collective goals to make us mm. uh, strive, which is not the case in organizations. So I think a lot of the problems from organizations, not psychology necessarily, is it's this kind of 
internal contradictions which necessarily exist in organizations. And you mentioned something important there, goals. And I think if you look at the psychological literature, if you look at neuroscience, there are a number of factors that, that uh, seem to be key in making good decisions. Being very clear about setting goals, um, being very clear about what the alternative pathways to those goals are and what information you need to, to bring to bear in order to set up those alternative pathways to the goal. And then absolutely critical, critically, you need to sort of look at the consequences of, of, of your decision. And so using feedback, this is how we learn. We, we look at the consequences of our decisions and reflect on those in order to change our behavior later on. And so making those, at least those three things, really explicit, I think is, is very important. And certainly the psychological literature would support those three things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, I would really emphasise the importance of collaborative, collaborative reasoning and decision making. I mean, no one of us can check our own biases and, our, you know, dispositions to make certain kinds of decisions. But, you know, but putting those decisions uh, or tentative decisions to the test with other people, you know, and looking for, mm. looking for feedback, looking for constructive criticism mm. uh, is a good way to sort of, you know, help, you know, check the whether your decision is a good one or not. And I think that's particularly important in corporations because I think you were mentioning earlier, I mean, sometimes corporations are so complex that decision-making is very distributed. There's no mm -hmm. one person who's making mm -hmm. any any decision and and information could get lost and totally. uh, bad decisions can or bad actions can result just mm -hmm. from nobody really having kind of a grip on it. So you need to, as much as possible, create those environments for good decision making right. within the organisation by the team, not by some one individual or leader. Mm. So on, on that form, I was reading recently a book by the psychologist Kurt Gikarnzer. He was talking exactly about that. He was comparing family firms and, you know, um, big corporation. Mm -hmm. And in family, family firms, you can, we can think, oh, they are likely to be inefficient, etc. But what happens is that people trust each other. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, you mess up, I can tell you, or you messed up, and you don't think that what I'm saying is trying you to undermine honest. you. You can be right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we're going to mend the relationship, etc. Mm -hmm. But in big corporation, maybe I don't want my underlings to tell me I messed up. I don't even want to ask because, you know, they could tell me I messed up. Mm -hmm. And so the information flow, which is desired, doesn't happen. And so a challenge that organizations have is to uh, make organizations more collaborative. Uh, one possibility, for instance, is to build, you know, uh, when they try to build this kind of collective identity when people think they have this kind of collective endeavor together, it's very difficult. But without this kind of thing, you have these tensions which makes it often dysfunctional, not necessarily because of psychology, but because of, of the uh, you know, existing natural the dynamics of the situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You talked about us, about us being social animals and that trust in a group of people is conducive to making good decisions then? Mm, I think so. I think it, Lionel's point about um, feeling like the, you, you're in a space where you can offer information, new information. Uh, I think, you know, in, in committee meetings and, and where decision making is happening in, in, in bodies, executive bodies, uh, I think it's very important. It's been shown, in fact, that it's important to make sure everyone's opinion is canvassed. Um, and often it's best to write that down first mm -hmm. because the first person to speak, often it's the person chairing the meeting, mm -hmm. setting the scene. That will determine the likely inputs you get from other members of that committee because of all these dynamics. Exactly. Uh, and so it's been shown that, that articulating ahead of time, before the meeting begins, writing your response to specific questions and then tabling those in the meetings is really valuable because everything gets heard. One of the themes that I really saw coming through when we asked people to submit their questions beforehand and might be being submitted right now was people asking about the role of technology in decision making and specifically questions about AI and what future, if any, AI might have in helping us make decisions. And AI is such a buzzword at the moment, sort of it feels easy to kind of go, no, 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 like let's not, but it probably will form at least some part of decision making, especially at this big kind of policy or national mm. level, what could that look like? Well, I think um, uh, whenever we have a new technology, we, we can see in the past that people were very often very bad at anticipating what would happen, how would the technology be used? I mean, uh, I don't think people would think that we would have phones and we'll be glued to it as a kind of mini computers doing social media things all the time. Um, same thing for AI, it's very hard to fully anticipate how we're going to use it. but. Um, it's, I believe the impact will be massive in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and one clearly, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to say something minimal, uh, not, no, there's a big picture, but I, I think one thing that it can do is provide this kind of personalized service, personal, personalized help that 
we don't have now. We could have, each of us could have a personal assistant knowing us, mm -hmm. knowing what we do, knowing what we want to do and, knowing, and helping us achieve what we want to do. You know, I may be somewhere and says, Lionel, you know, you've got a meeting in 30 minutes and you're not heading that way. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you have not forgotten something? Mm -hmm. You know, and that all these kind of things could be very useful uh, and very, very uh, for productivity all the time. These things are, are, are really critical right now. So in the military, in defense, mm -hmm. there's a lot of focus on autonomous systems, um, systems that guide themselves, drones in the field. Um, missiles that seek their own targets autonomously that can respond quickly without human intervention. And we need to think about the ethics of those kinds of things. What happens? Who's at fault if a drone makes a mistake? Mm. Um, in the healthcare sector as well, exactly the same thing. AI is fantastic at recognizing patterns in complex data, much better than humans are. Uh, and so areas like radiology, you know, picking up cancers and tumors and so on. AI is perfect for that kind of thing. But we need to ask ourselves, do we, do we, to what extent do we want to put ourselves in that loop? At what point do we want the human to intervene and make the final decision? Mm -hmm. So healthcare, defense, education, I could go on. I think, you know, I agree, but I think we have to exercise a little bit of caution. I mean, you mentioned health, for example, and certainly, you know, there are these diagnostic um, AIs now and the jury is kind of out on, you know, how well they compare with, you know, with um, clinicians in terms of making diagnostic judgments. I mean, in general, I think that AI could be quite useful, particularly, you know, we mentioned base rate fallacies before. I mean, particularly as a way of calculating um, you know, what the base rate actually is, you know. So it can be very, very useful with those computational tasks in, in complex demands where, you know, complex tasks where there's, you know, a lot of data to process. I can see where they would be actually indispensable in terms of our decision making. But there's something to bear in mind about an AI, and that is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that what's fundamental to human decision making is that we have this concern for the truth. We care about the truth. We care about what's good for us and perhaps, you know, and like more widely what's good for the environment and all those sorts of things. And an AI system doesn't care. It doesn't <laughs> care about the truth. It, you know, it, it uh, will produce um, information, whether it's true or false, according to its pro a program. And if we're lucky, it'll be true, but it could well be false. And the system just doesn't care. So, you know, we've seen with robo debt, for example, AI systems, you know, deciding, uh, you know, who gets a welfare check or who deserves welfare payments or not. And, and that was a disaster. And there's nothing in the system that cares which way the decision goes one way or, or the other, where the decision goes. Mm. Uh, I may add, because we're in an educational setting, another application where something would be very relevant is that we can all have a personal teacher. Mm. So one of the difficulty You're when putting you putting yourself learn, out of a job. <laughs> a, a bit, a bit. <laughs> so... One thing that everybody who's gone through education uh, understands that, uh, you know, you have a kind of a slope of, of learning. And if the slope is too steep, then it's discouraging, right? And if it's too, too flat, then it's discouraging because it's boring. And so you have kind of a sweet spot to find what's kind of motivating enough and not too easy, not too hard. And basically, the AI can provide us this kind of personalized slope. That is, this is my question at this stage of my understanding on this problem. This is what I understand. This is what I don't understand. And the AI can tailor the progress that I want by giving me the answers I need at the moment, which is quite unique. Mm. So I think whatever job we have, we'll have to adapt to this new reality. Mm. There's also ethics around how these things are actually designed because they're, even though they are powered by computing as they go on, they're fundamentally designed by humans. Well, and they're fed by data and the data yeah. that they're fed, that, that determines everything in terms of the, the, the outcomes. But then again, you could say that's the same for humans, right? Sure. We're, we're ultimately a product of what we're exposed to and the biases that we have and the prejudices that we have are a consequence of our, our entire life history. So in that sense, an AI system is not actually fundamentally different than in, in terms of those, those biases. Yeah, I mean, I guess the worry is that it's kind of garbage in, garbage out problem, right? I mean, if you think about chat GPT at the moment and um, and its unreliability, I mean, it's really just a synthesising device, right? It kind of is pulling information that's out there, not just pulling that information that's out there. And so irrespective of the quality of it, it can't judge the quality of the information, but it's also adding to that information. So if it's processing garbage, then it's going to make more garbage and we're just going to exacerbate the problem. And I think, you know, that's the difference between humans and these AIs mm. is, is that... I disagree. <laughs> I'm just going to finish here. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that 
we have the capacity to evaluate the quality of the information or garbage as it may be. Uh, and you know that it's interesting. There's one because we actually did a test on this um, in the philosophy department here. My colleague Peter Ellerton did a little test on what Chat GPT's capabilities were with respect to arguments, and it can analyze argue, uh, analyze arguments. It can compare arguments. The one thing it cannot do is evaluate an argument, um, which I think is salutary. And we mm. we can still evaluate an argument, can't but we, I think Jason? we're sitting in an oh, academic he's bubble. Me. We're, we're sitting in an <laughs> academic bubble. So I have no doubt that that that. You know, people here, academics, mm. people who are experts in their field can do that evaluation, but I don't think that's always true. And that's part of the learning process is learning what outcomes do I need to take into account to improve my my behavior, my decisions in the future. And in a way, that is what AI systems are doing. Good AI systems will take mm. mistakes, will take errors and, and take those back in. Of course, if the training data are poor quality, just like with a human, the outcomes will be poor as well. So I don't think fundamental, I think there are, there are algorithmic differences that are really important, but in terms of evaluating and using feedback, I actually don't see fundamental differences. And, and yeah, but start as you well. are talking in normative language there, right? I mean, <laughs> just sorry. Uh, you trying to come English for us, uh, non-academics over here. Oh, I am. I wear it as a badge of honor. <laughs> but we're also really talking about the start. Chat GPT, you know, is, has been amazing. Like, I surprise everybody. We didn't have these expectations. But really, talking, think, seeing the start of this phenomenon, we have to think back about, you know, the first phones, which are mobile phones, like this clunky stuff, which are like archaeological. Like bricks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what's going to be Chat GPT 6, Chat GPT 10? Mm, yeah. Right? Exactly. Um, exactly. It's going to be very different. Or what happens if they're neural nets? Mm. Mm. Well, that's what they're based on. Most AI, AI systems are, in fact, inspired by the organization of the brain, the idea that you have a hierarchy of layers, that information is fed forward and fed back. Mm. Um, it's a closed-loop system. AI systems are inspired by the organization of the brain. So You're funny. making my dystopian future my present. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm Sorry, happy, dude. but yeah, I'm going to go home crying. <laughs> Coming back to the human brain, a question for you, Jason, that was asked by a couple of different people. Cheryl and Helen were both asking about the, the role of the brain and its structure in decision making, especially when it comes to brain injuries and how that affects mm. our ability to make decisions. Right, right. I mean, I think generally speaking, the way we, we might think about it, very simplistically, a brain making decisions is it's kind of accumulating evidence over a period of time toward being able to execute some kind of behavior. Now, behavior might be overt, you might be able to see it, uh, or it might be covert, just you reach a decision in your mind, but nobody else outside uh, can see that. Um, any kind of brain injury, particularly brain injuries that, that affect parts of the brain that are normally involved in uh, executive control, uh, regulating our attention, uh, any of those brain areas, if they're damaged through pathology, uh, are likely to lead to decision-making impairments, deficits. And we do see across a whole range of clinical conditions um, psychiatric and neurological and developmental conditions, we see impairments in, in decision making in, in those cases. They can be very subtle things, they can affect what we perceive, how we make decisions about who it is we see in front of us, but they can also affect really sort of high level decision making where it's more the kind of thing that Deb was discussing with these very explicit decisions around weighing evidence to, to make a sort of final rational uh, decision about the outcome. Um, so depending on the nature of the impairment, uh, of the damage, you can get different kinds of decision-making impairment. How do you then empower an individual with a brain injury to be able to make decisions and have autonomy still? Deb, Jason, whoever wants to weigh in. Oh, well, it would, I mean, it really does depend on the level of impairment. Mm. Um, but I, I guess, I mean, I guess all I could say uh, in response to that is, is really the importance of thinking about de decision-making collectively. Um, mm. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think all of us should be making decisions collectively as much as possible, just getting people to, to check our biases, to check our reasoning about something and, and to, be, to be comfortable with disagreement. Um, so I would imagine in these kinds of cases, you need additional support. Yeah, this, this is a real world problem. I mm. mean, this is when we think about um, giving people power of attorney, for example, mm -hmm. we're, we're saying we give another person the power to make decisions for us. And these clinicians, people in the, the legal profession and social services, they're, they're having to make those decisions about individuals all the time on a regular basis. Should I empower another person or a group of people to make decisions on behalf of this person? And so it's really 
important, a, a big part of clinical assessment for people who have had brain injuries is to uh, evaluate their competence and evaluate their competence to make decisions that are right for them, that are safe for them. We are going to come to your questions in just a moment. Don't forget that you can add yours to the list by hitting that Q&A button on uh, the screen where you're watching us right now. Uh, but before we get to that, with, with everyone, not just people with brain injuries, all sorts of uh, humans trying to make decisions, we've talked around in circles about all the different things we should weigh, and we've got unconscious biases, and you should be weighing decision, and it just sort of feels like a recipe for paralysis, mm. never being able to make a decision. And of course, not making a decision has a cost as well. How do you get around that paralysis around decision making? Um, well, so people are worried of making the wrong decision and then people are worried of regretting the decision. So, so um, sometimes, you know, by anticipation, you, 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 you think about everything which could go wrong. Um, but once again, I would be more optimistic here. I would think that, you know, regret is actually very useful because by anticipating regret, then it nudges us to, to, to look carefully in all the information we could use to make a decision, not to make decisions too quickly because there would be a cost of making decisions too, quick, too quickly. Mm -hmm. And then after finding out that, oh, geez, I should have done things differently. I, I regret my decision. So <laughs> anticipating regret is kind of telling mm -hmm. us now, uh, have I done the job? Have I, you know, have I looked into all the options I have, into the quality of the options, etc.? So I think that there is a balance. And most often, I suspect we are well balanced. And, and sometimes we may be very stressed. The stakes may be very high. And, and that may lead us to be procrastinating on the decision. Mm. Um, that's true. But often I think this balance is, is, is the right thing to, for us to feel. Mm. Jason? I mean, ma not making a decision in an odd way is, a, is sort of a decision in itself, right? And I think what people often don't do is to add that as one of the potential options toward their goal. Whatever they're considering making a decision on, understanding if I do nothing, these will be the consequences. Thinking forward, as Deb said, it's decisions are all, all about what, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and, and often we don't add not doing anything as one of the options. And I think it's really important to have that as one of the clear options that there will be consequences if I do nothing at this point. And I think often there's some neglect around that point. Mm. Deb? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the risk of inaction is is often something that, that people neglect in discussions about, about decision making. So it's very important to take that in, into consideration. I mean, I really, I really like um, Lionel's point about, about regret because, you know, we often think about decision making as is trying to sort of get the optimal outcome for ourselves, you know, satisfying our wants. Um, but there was, you know, for a while, um, a lot of work done in decision theory um, that made use of regret strategies rather than the sort of standard decision theoretic rules like, you know, maxi-max, maximising the maximum outcome of your actions, or maxi-min, ma mm. maximising the, you know... Some the cleaning products. The minimum, yes, I know. <laughs> I like, yes, yes, I'm getting out my maxi-max <laughs> to do my decision-making today. Um, you know, but, but I liked regret strategies because there the, the option, the object was not so much you know, getting the best outcome because we don't have control over that necessarily. We can try and influence the future, but, you know, but things can fall apart. We can be mistaken and so on. Mm. Um, but the idea was to, to sort of think about the potential actions you can perform in terms of how much regret they would produce if there was a better outcome that you missed out on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I liked, I liked this one particular strategy, which was called the tempered regret strategy by, uh, I think it was Mary Acker. And, and she, was, she was sort of interested in the fact that when we make decisions and we're, we're worried about regret, there's also some relief in realising that you haven't got the worst outcome. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and some relief in having acted at all, right? I actually remember seeing at QBI where Jason is working, a very interesting talk by a neuroscientist, uh, Molteg, mm -hmm. um, showing that if you gamble some money and you lose, but you find, you, we would expect as economists would think, oh, if you lose money, you'd be unhappy. Mm -hmm. But if you found out that, you know, let's say you, you place a stock market and you, you lose a bit of money, but you realize that you could have gamble more and you would have lost even more yes. you'd feel like oh <laughs> at least i'm not like you know i didn't yeah. lose all my money didn't put my house so, on it and so they measured you know neuronal activity which shows yeah. that when you were losing you were really to feel whether you're happy or not you were comparing to all the other possibilities including mm. the worst case scenario yeah, and if yeah. you have just lost a bit you feel, you feel good yeah. exactly and i gather i mean in uh, economics it actually 
these sort of regret strategies help to predict consumer behaviour, you know, why people go for the mid-priced television set. Because right. if you if buy the cheapest one, it could be a lemon and then you'd really regret it. Mm. And if you pay too much for the product, then you're going to regret that as well. So that's, mm. that's what this sort of thinking drives people into that sort of safe middle mm. ground mm. in terms of their consumerism. And mm. businesses yeah. play to that by making sure there's a couple of different Honest options. options yeah. And I'll just say this, I mean, philosophically, regret is hugely interesting. I mean, since the 17th century, um, people have referred to it as the principal obstacle to happiness. So, oh. As Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, put in a plug for Princess Elizabeth, <laughs> described regret as the principal obstacle of happiness. Mm. Interesting. That is the most beautiful thing <laughs> I've ever heard. Um, questions from the audience coming in via that Q&A button, which you can still add to. And I'll start with... Um, it's actually, there's a real theme here. Lauren is asking about self-sabotage. Uh, for example, we all know what's good for us, eating right, exercise through to the people we surround ourselves with, but we often decide to go against these at times. Why are we so bad at taking care of ourselves? So um, there may be other explanations, but you know, as I, as I pointed before, often the kind of what we think are mistakes or biases when we just focus on the individual makes sense when we look at individual in a group. And, and, and self-sabotage, you know, often people try to talk to other people, to, to, to send messages to other people. And, and um, there's what's called cheap talk. You know, I say, I say mm -hmm. something and say, oh, yes, but, you know, you could say that. You could say something else. I don't believe you. Or I could act in a way which signals that credibly I mean it. So you know, if I'm a teenager and I start, you know, doing things, I could be harming myself. Maybe I'm telling my parents, you need to pay attention to me because things are wrong, right? So that's, that's a credible signal I'm sending to other people. It could be to my partner. You know, if I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and I'm unhappy with the relationship, I can you know, also do something which hurt myself, which tell that. Um, another example in a totally different situation, you, in prisons, a very famous example is people um, self kind of hurt, you know, the, uh, prisoners will take knives and, you know, uh, uh, hurt themselves. And what are they saying? They're saying, you know, I'm, I'm crazy, I, I can be a pain, don't mess up with me because prisons can be a very tough environment. So by signaling this kind of behavior, people are like, oh, this guy, you know, with all these marks, you know, I maybe I shouldn't go into a fight because who knows what could happen, mm -hmm. right? I'm not a, he's, he's not a pushover. So that's an important part of the, of the explanation of this. I, I think it's also important to remember the reward mechanisms in the brain. So often the self-sabotaging behaviors are decisions that are made to satisfy a need right now. So, you know, if I see a lovely cream bun in front of me, I'm feeling rather hungry right now, even though I know it's probably not good for me, the, the centers that are regulating my behavior now are saying, that's, that's nourishment, that's calories, you don't know where the next meal's coming from necessarily, take that now. So often these kinds of behaviors are where there's a reward circuit that's responding to what's immediate and kind of discounting the, the future consequences. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that complicates decision making is that we don't just have wants at the first order level. Mm. We have these second order wants as well. So, I mean, and it, it helps to understand addictions, for example, like an addict is somebody who wants to, to have that next cigarette, but, you know, they might also have a higher order want to, to not to have that want. Um, and, uh, and somebody who just operates from their first order wants which refer to in philosophy as a, a wanton, or as my students say, wanton. <laughs> um, you know, is 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 somebody you know who is probably not uh, you know op operating as as a kind of fully fledged person. You know, I mean, if if you just sort of acted from your wants all the time, whatever they were, I'm going to have six chocolate eclairs right. for breakfast. Um, then, then you're not really sort of exercising your rational faculties. But because we have these higher order wants. They can they can come into conflict with our first order wants, and and then it's like a, you know a tussle between the two. And, and thank it, goodness they do. Yeah, <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of those rewarding urges are destructive yeah. urges, or are not good for us, or are not culturally or socially acceptable urges. Yeah, right. Are you saying there's something wrong with having six chocolate, <laughs> chocolate <-y laughs> <for> breakfast? breakfast. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> Standard breakfast. <laughs> Following on what they've been saying, a very good example about about that is we tend to think that we want to be happy. You know, we're chasing happiness, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. A philosopher, uh, uh, Robert Nozick. Nozick, has, yeah. Has this, Experience machine. This, yeah. this <laughs> experiment says, well, imagine, basically, imagine the matrix. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if I was to plug you in the matrix and you can be rich, you can be famous, you can be happy, you can work, whatever you want. You just be plugged in, a, you'll be floating in a, in a, you know, a, you know, a bottle of water and electrodes in your brain and that's it. So that's all your life. Do you want to jump in the matrix? And most people say, 
doesn't sound no. so good. Yeah, exactly. I want to be happy, but I want something else. I want a real life. I want something authentic. Mm. So that's interesting because we tend to think we want, want happiness, but when we're put to this yeah. opportunity, we, we actually you know we want no, something else. Mm. Yeah, that's a lovely example. And in Nozick's point is that we you know we don't opt for that because we care about the truth, mm-hmm. and that isn't that isn't real. It isn't the, it isn't the truth, mm. uh, and. And you know, philosophers will often say that what you care about defines you as a person. And I, I, I think feel very strongly that we do care about the truth, we do care about reality, and we do care about the good, which is why we end up in these kinds of conflicts. Mm. So one of the questions that has coming through saying, like simplicity, how do we improve our ability to make good decisions and quickly? Truth and goodness are those sort of some of the pillars that you would put forward there? Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to that, right? How do we improve our decision making? And that may take time. That may, you know, take investigating the situation. Uh, It may take um, opportunities to collaborate with trusted others. Uh, And and so, you know, it's best if we have time. Um, And if you have time, then take it. But sometimes we have to act and we don't have the luxury of lengthy deliberation. and, and then we, you know, then we have to, you know, as, as quickly as possible, bear in mind that our actions have effects that we may not be able to control and, and just, you know, as quickly as we can think those through. I mean, it's interesting, my, my project team and the Critical Thinking Project at UQ, we're doing a lot of work at the moment with the Australian Institute of Police Management. And we're, you know, we're helping them to understand critical thinking and good decision making and so on. And, and these are people who have to make, you know, very quick decisions um, and don't have the luxury of lengthy deliberation. But what they try to do as much as possible when they're not in a crisis situation is to build their capabilities in thinking and decision making so that when they can, when they have to act quickly, mm. they can rely on, you know, on these, you know, thought processes and their habits around good thinking and decision making as best as possible. But that's a really hard question. You know, it's a great question, but a hard one. From, from a neuroscience perspective, what we know is that there, there are fundamental information processing limits in brains uh, that, that we just can't get past, right? There's only so much information you can attend to at once. There's only so much information you can evaluate. And so ultimately, as humans, we will always come up against that hard barrier. Being able to make a complex decision in a second, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, to come back to your point, Lionel, about using AI as a an additional source, a way that you can offload some information processing, I can see that's where AI could be helpful in decision making, right? That you, mm-hmm. yeah. you take, you, you bypass the, the bottleneck of information processing that the brain enforces on us yeah. and you say, I'm going to push some of that out to an autonomous system and have that distilled information come back so I can make a rapid decision on it. I think maybe if I can add something on that, I would say also that we tend to, we may be thinking that the best way of do, making good decisions is to be very rational, to think a lot about it, etc. Well, actually, something which is compatible with what uh, Jason Debbie have, have said is that um, the, the world is very complex. And often if we have to think things through on the spot, it's very difficult. And institutions like police um, you know, officers having to make decisions. The, the way it works is to have been trained to this kind of situation and again and again when you get the right intuition, the right gut feelings are in place, you've done, exper- you've done uh, ex- um, experiments, scenarios, etc. Yeah. Scenarios, scenario buildings, games, etc. Mm. And that's, it's a bit like the pianist, you know, the pianist, you don't, you don't think, oh, I'm, I'm, plan- I'm planning to, p- to play a piece I'm go- and this is going to be my plan, I'm going to play this and this and that. And when you play the piano, you almost forget your fingers. Mm. And it has to be the same. So good decisions is through practice more than through this kind of rational planning that often we, we focus a lot in organizations. Mm-hmm. How do you practice that? Well, organization now, you can have lots, lots of games. Like if you look at the, you know, there's a war, unfortunately, at the moment, and, and you can see that what soldiers do, they have to make these decisions, very quick, high-stake decisions. They prepare a lot. They do a lot of gaming, mm-hmm. a lot of gaming. And it sounds like, you know, why do they need to do all these scenarios and, and make a believe situations? Because... You never know how reality is going to be, always lots of surprises, and you develop the right reflexes, the right intuitions by preparing yourself like that. Yeah, I mean, scenario planning is a great technique for, you know, for organisations like this to work with. And, and, you know, we do some work with them, with the police and emergency services yeah. uh, around scenario planning as well, where you, you, kind of, you kind of take factors that might, you know, disrupt your activity and you create a, a you know a two axis grid and you're th- you're thinking about what happens at the intersection of these 
of these factors. So, you know, what would happen if you had a, a pandemic, you know, combined with, you know, mm say, hyper-nationalism. Um, and so you're thinking about, oh, what would happen if we had a pandemic and we had, you know, nas high nationalism? Or what would happen if we had a pandemic and we had cosmopolitanism? Mm. And then you can kind of think about how you would behave in these different scenarios. And that's that sort of, you know, requires all of our cognitive capabilities around thinking about plausible scenarios, plausible outcomes, how would we, we would act. And it's 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 not exactly planning as such. It's really more like, you know, cognitive exercises mm. to prepare you to not be surprised mm. by these very, you know, different and uh, different and difficult outcomes. But is it in from a brain point of view, is it something that you can practice and get better at? Oh yeah. I mean we we do that all the time. We we turn things that are effortful and, and require enormous amounts of of attention and kind of sap our energy and we turn them into things that are automatic, that become habits. Um, uh, you can think about anything you learn for the first time. Um, the act of reading, where we, know, we take, literate adults take that for granted, but you know, children really struggle to learn to read, to decode those printed arbitrary forms on a page and turn it into to meaning. And so there are lots of it, those examples. And that's what the brain is very good at. It's, it's a kind of generalist, so it can take information, can apply the difficult energy sapping processes do it over and over using feedback and then make that an automatic process and kind of shift it off to the side and free up these sort of cognitive resources for new new challenges. Another question, I might just talk okay. through because it actually plays to something you were okay. mentioning before. Um, another question is something that you mentioned, which is about human evolution and what we have and haven't evolved for. And someone's asking, is decision making evolving in humans? Well, it has been it's evolving now. I think the, the scale of evolution, I'm not sure it's, it's that fast. Uh, but maybe for some decisions which are highly consequential, maybe it does. I mean, uh, you know, we had a pandemic, so maybe, you know, some people, maybe it was not, fortunately, as deadly as some past pandemics, but, you know, if some decision can be consequential. But I think the, the most, the biggest insight we have from evolution is that if you take the, you know, the history of the human history, it's basically uh, hundreds of thousands or almost a million of years of, of history, uh, where we lived in very, very, very different situations. Mm. And then, you know, you, you take 50 years ago, the majority of the population was living in rural situations, right? Mm. And then you throw <laughs> us in modern, highly urban societies, and now you give us, you know, mobile very phones. abstract, right? Very abstract. Re thinking is very abstract now. Very abstract. And, and I would say there's two things at least we can think that are very different is that first, the time horizon is very different. I mean, you, you have to make decisions at 20 mm. about pensions that you're going to get at 60. Mm. I mean, this is just, you know, out of the kind of range or ancestors had to face. And also the situation is much more peaceful than in the past. And we, uh, you know, we were talking about that uh, before the show. Uh, you know, our ancestors, so there was a lot of, 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 of violence, uh, conflicts, and, and we do look at the statistics. So a lot of people, you know, were involved or victims of murders, etc. Uh, this is not the case anymore. And so a lot of our psychology sometimes, or paranoia, or, you know, mm. we can see, mm. is triggered to react to this kind of dangers and is out of sync with the kind of modern society we're in. So that's the biggest insight, I think. Mm. Jason? I would just agree with, with, what, um, with what Lionel said. I, I think that what, what we're doing now increasingly in a complex world is we're thinking abstractly. That was, that was the point. And, and that's something that I think, you know, 100, 200, 300 years ago, generally speaking, that kind of capacity for the average person wasn't something that was exercised. I agree with Lionel that we talk about an evolutionary time scale. I don't think we're, we're, I don't think our brains are changing. I think we're still using the old hardware, but I think we're using it in new ways now. Mm -hmm. I might end with one final question that I'll direct to you, Deb, um, from George. Why is making the decision to defy my parents' wishes and grow a mullet so satisfying? Ah, well, um, so that's a very interesting question. And it just goes to show you that even our worst decisions can be satisfying. I mean, you know, I mean, what is that whole business at the front party at the back thing? I mean, it did not work so well for Boris Johnson. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, you know, but I think the deeper point there is that is that what, you know, even if our decisions don't work out, we don't get the outcome that we desire, there's something satisfying about exercising our autonomy. Mm. And, and children, you see this, you know, in, in infants, right, when they, when they hit the mobile for the first time, it's this, it's this awareness of agency. Mm. I move that, you know. And, and I think that as, as children grow up, some of their, their most valuable experiences can be 
defying their parents. Um, and I think as parents, you know, we should embrace that, you know, that sort of growing independence <laughs> and sense of autonomy, even if as parents, you know, we can't bear to look at them um, with their mullets. <laughs> My son did exactly that. He grew a mullet for his year 12 formal. <laughs> oh, classy. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you all for exercising your autonomy and choosing to be part of this panel tonight. We do have to leave it there. Thank you so much to our panellists, Deborah, Jason and Lionel. And thank you for joining us. We so appreciate having so many alumni from around the world joining us at these events. We look forward to seeing you at our next in-person UQ Talks in September. It is on pain research. Do not miss it, it's going to be really interesting. And our next online UQ talk is in November on Net Zero. Keep an eye on your inbox for these invitations, but for now, good night. <laughs>